Okay, so on last Wednesday we were discussing the eigenvalues of Fermission operators. For us, the Fermission op operators will eventually become the observables. So we observe whatever we observe, there will be a corresponding Fermission operator. And we had seen that if there is no degeneracy, the eigenval the eigenstates of a Hermitian operator, let's say we have this H, or then we define these eigenkets. Alpha was the eigenvalue, uh, and the ket was the eigenket. Let's just also give them some number. Then they were orthogonal, alpha i, alpha j is, e is proportional to Kronecker delta i, j, if, no, not Kronecker delta, it is zero if alpha i is different than alpha j. So this tell, told us that if the states are not degenerate, then if they correspond to different eigenvalues, then they, they are definitely orthogonal to each other. We can further normalize them. Instead of using, let's say, alpha i, we can just use alpha i over the magnitude of alpha i. And so that <coughs> these uh, new states, let's call them beta i, beta i, beta i, is just one. So the magnitude of each state is one different uh, eigenstates. They are orthogonal to each other if they correspond to different eigenvalues. And then there were these questions about what happens if there is degeneracy. Can we still do this? And we will start with that discussion. We will first show that we can still choose a basis. Let's say beta i properly normalized. They are each uh, eigenstates of our operator, Hermitian operator. And they are orthogonal, orthogonal to each other. Now, this condition is automatically satisfied if they, they have different eigenvalues. It's not so straightforward if they are degenerate. And now we will see what, what we can do if they are degenerate. Now, before we continue, do you have any questions? About the things we had covered last week? <coughs> Of course, we might not have enough technology to measure it yet, but in principle, it is measurable. So just for simplicity, let's take a case where we have two states, alpha 1, alpha 2, such that we have this one, uh, operator, Hermitian operator, acting on each one. They are the eigenstates of this Hermitian operator with the same eigenvalue. Then there is no reason for alpha 1 to be orthogonal to alpha 2. Because our proof that the eigenkets are orthogonal to each other if they have a different eigenvalues. But these two kets, they have the same eigenvalue, so they don't need to be orthogonal to each other. We don't, there is no proof. In fact, in general, they will not be orthogonal to each other. You see, uh, the problem with this degeneracy is that even if you take such a combination, <coughs> let's act on this kit with our Hermitian operator. Now, the operators that we will be dealing with, they are linear operators which basically means that if you act with our operator on the sum of two things, it's the same thing as you act with your operator on each one of those terms and then sum. So this will be equal to, here we are using the linearity. So this is A times H alpha 1 plus B times H alpha 2. 
Well, we know that h alpha 1 is nothing but alpha times alpha 1, and h alpha 2 is just alpha times alpha 2. Alpha is common, so we can just take it out. Alpha is just a number. <coughs> so this is equal to alpha times a alpha 1 plus b alpha 2. But this is nothing but alpha times beta. So if you have two degenerate cats, two different cats that they have the same eigenvalue, any of their linear combinations still has the same eigenvalue. So this is kind of the origin of our problem of problem, meaning that uh, two cats having the same eigenvalue need not be orthogonal to each other. But this, this will be also our solution. So because instead of using alpha 1 and using alpha 1 and alpha 2 cats, we can use some of their linear combinations which will be orthogonal to each other. So that will be our solution, let's say. Now, to, orthogonal, to choose such a cat, let's say alpha, we, have, we started with this state. <coughs> and let's assume that alpha 1, alpha 2, they are not orthogonal to each other. There is no reason for them to be orthogonal, since they are degenerate. Now let's define new states. Well, I can define this beta one to be just alpha one. So this is an eigenket. H of beta one is equal to alpha times beta one. And then we can define beta two. It was alpha two, but it, alpha two is not orthogonal to alpha one. Now again, if you just use the analogy with real space, let's say you have this vector, you have this other vector, they are not orthogonal to each other, meaning that there is a component, let's say, of this vector which is parallel to my first vector. And there is also another component perpendicular to my first vector. So I can divide this vector into two parts. One part that is parallel, the other part that is orthogonal to my first vector. So to get this orthogonal part, what I need to do is take this vector. From this vector, I have to subtract the component of this parallel to my initial vector. That is what I will do. So I will define alpha beta 2 as alpha 2 minus, I will take alpha 2, consider its component in the direction of alpha 1, multiply it with alpha 1. So let's see if, if this beta 2 vector is orthogonal to beta 1. I'm also using the fact that uh, alpha 1 is a unit vector. So in principle, I should also divide this by alpha 1, alpha 1. But that denominator is just 1. So let's, let's check beta 2, beta 1. This is equal to, well, beta, now let me say beta 1, beta 2. The bra of beta 1 is nothing but the bra of alpha 1. The ket of beta 2, we had just defined it over here. Alpha 2 minus alpha 1. Alpha 1, alpha 2, divided by alpha 1, alpha 1. Let's just multiply them up. This is equal to alpha 1, alpha 2 minus alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 2 divided by alpha 1, alpha 1. Well, since alpha 1 was properly normalized, this factor and this factor, they are just 1. If, it, if alpha 1 was not properly normalized, then it doesn't really matter. They just cancel each other. So we just get the inner product of alpha 1 and alpha 2 minus the inner product of alpha 1 and alpha 2. So this is equal to 0. And since beta 2 is a linear combination of alpha 2 and alpha 1, and alpha 2 and alpha 1, they are both uh, eigenkets of my Hermitian operator with eigenvalue alpha, Beta 2 is also an uh, eigenket of our Hermitian operator with eigenvalue alpha. <coughs> so 
So when we were looking for the eigenkets of the, our Hermitian operator, uh, beta h, we say we found these two kets. Two independent kets. They still form a basis, but they are not, ortho they are not orthogonal to each other. But still, this procedure, you can also repeat it for uh, two vectors, three vectors. Now, we did it for two vectors. You can generalize it to three, four, arbitrary number of dimensions. It allows you to choose. Now, this time, you are allowed to choose your eigenkets. You see, if there is no degeneracy, we don't have any choice. The eigenkets are fixed, and we have to use those eigenkets as our basis. Well, we don't have to. It will be wise for us to use those. They will simplify our life. If there is degeneracy, that means the eigenkets need not be orthonormal. They don't need to be orthogonal, but just like these alpha 1 and alpha 2. But we can still choose a basis which is formed by orthogonal states, like in this example, beta 1 and beta 2. Now, there's still the question, how do we determine these beta 1 and beta 2? Well, it's kind of arbitrary. Just like, for example, if you have the x-axis, the y-axis, let's say you have in real space, you have two vectors. You just should pick one of them and pick the orthogonal component of the other one. You get these two vectors. But you can still also use these two vectors or these two vectors. They, are, they will still be orthogonal to each other. So which one to choose? Well, it's again up to you. It's just your, as I said, it is your choice. Some choices will make your life easier. Some choices will make your life harder. But nevertheless, it's your choice. The conventional choice that we will see later on is that if there is degeneracy in the eigenvalues of some, uh, some Hermitian operator, that usually tells us that there is another Hermitian operator which commutes with our initial Hermitian operator. So, and so we just choose a basis which diagonalizes both of them. Now that we will discuss later on. So, but the, uh, let's say the final conclusion we have is that if you have a Hermitian operator, single one, that would allow us to choose a basis for our, to describe our state, and this basis will be orthonormal. The basis vectors will be orthogonal to each other, and we can properly normalize them. This, will, this is the basic idea. If there is a Fermission operator, that allows us to choose an orthonormal basis to describe our states. <coughs> yes, no? <coughs> Questions? <coughs> well, we will come to that later on. At least for the time being, we know that we can do it if we want. Now, why do we want it? That will come. So for the time being, we are just used learning our tools. We don't have to use those tools. But if, if to determine whether we will use, be using those tools or not, we have to know its properties. So that's what we are trying at the moment. Just learning the properties of our tools so that when we need something, we will know whether that tool is usable or not, useful or not. Yes. The degenerate, I mean, when we have these two sets of operators, commuting operators, we will see that if we either, if we diagonalize one of them, the other one is automatically diagonalized. This is the case when there's no degeneracy. And when there is degeneracy, we will see that we can choose our basis such that both are diagonalized at the same time. We will cover it today or in the worst case on Wednesday. Questions? No? 
Well, well, you see, what we are saying here is that if there is degeneracy, we have certain choices. It might happen that we just come up with two orthogonal states, that, two states that are orthogonal, but that's just by chance. Or we might come up, I mean, you have one way of solving the question and it automatically gives you two st states that are orthogonal to each other. But he might have a different way of, different way of taking steps and he would get uh, two states that won't be orthogonal. But if there is degeneracy, if you get, at your first attempt, if you get orthogonal states, that is chance. Now let's, let's continue a bit. We have these <coughs> basis cats. Let me just show it by alpha i. And we had just seen that we can choose them orthonormal to each other. Well, we will also see that this, uh, this normal, normalizing to a Kronecker delta doesn't really always work. I mean, there will be some cases where we cannot really normalize it to Kronecker delta, but when we come there, we will be discussing that. So for the time being, just keep in mind that Okay, we will be using this Kronecker delta normalization, but eventually we will see some cases where this is not usable. So we have this basis. So what's the basis? Okay, we have been talking about for basis, I don't like this for one hour. So what's the basis? Look, if you don't ask me questions, I will ask you questions. They don't have to be orthonormal. So that's not really the definition of a basis. Spanning a space? Span it spans a space. I mean, it's the minimum set that spans our space. So basically, it tells me that if if a set is called a basis, I cannot write any one element in that set in terms of a linear combination of the other elements. That is one property of the basis. And if there is any element in my space, any element, let's say beta, can be written as a linear superposition of these. So let's say beta i, some numbers, beta i, in our case, there will be some complex numbers. So this ket beta can be any ket in our space. And since alpha i's, they form a basis, I, I should be able to write this beta in terms of all these alpha i's. So this is the definition of a basis in a vector space. Now, we said that these bases, the elements of bases, they need not be orthonormal. But we will choose them to be orthonormal so that it will simplify our lives. And the simplification would be in how do we determine these beta i's. So if we choose the alpha i kets, our basis elements, as an orthonormal basis, then it will be quite easy to choose the beta i's. Because just take the inner product of beta with alpha j. So this will be equal to beta i, alpha j, alpha i. Now we know that this is an orthonormal basis, so this element is just Kronecker delta i j. It is zero if uh, alpha i and alpha, alpha j ket and alpha i ket, they are different kets. And we had already seen that even if our system is degenerate, we can always choose our basis in this form. So here I have a summation over i. But that Kronecker data just tells me that in that summation over i, only the i is equal to j term survives. So this is equal to beta j. Or I can say that beta i is equal to alpha i times beta. Now, if I didn't choose my basis kets as an orthonormal 
uh, basis, then this equation for each j, it will give me a linear equation that couples, is a coupled linear uh, algebraic equation, it would be. Because each equation will involve many datas. It is still solvable, but it will just take more steps. Again, I repeat, we don't have to choose a basis that is orthonormal. But except in very few exceptional cases, it's always wise to choose an orthonormal basis. So let's go back. This beta now is beta i. Well, we have already determined what beta i is. So it's just alpha i, beta. This number, this inner product is just a number multiplied with alpha i. Or I can write it in a different form. Well, we know the associativity of this product that we are defining on our bras and kits, so I can just put parentheses wherever I want. Well, that ket beta is independent of i, it's just like a constant, I can just take it out. So any state beta can be written as that operator acting on the ket beta. Now that operator basically doesn't change anything. But an operator that doesn't change anything is just the identity operator. Now uh, this relation is also sometimes called the completeness relation. Or sometimes this is called the resolution of identity. Because basically it tells you that if you find some sketch alpha i, for which that sum is identity, then you know that any state can be written as a linear superposition of those kets alpha i. Now, let's also discuss the matrix representation. So that after this matrix representation, we will just go back to our uh, physical discussion. So what, I mean, here we are kind of developing the mathematical tools that we might need, but how we will use them to describe the quantum mechanical systems. Well, as far as I know, for example, matrix were developed by Heisenberg. I mean, well, her, being a Hermitian is a general property of operators, not necessarily of matrices. Well, as physicists, we are kind of weird people. I mean, whenever we need something, we develop it. So some of them were already developed by mathematicians. Some of them were developed by physicists because they needed it. Well, Newton, he needed calculus, so he invented calculus. Of course, there was also Leibniz who was working on calculus, but Newton was one of the greatest contributors. Or if you look at, I don't know, general relativity, you know, Einstein di didn't develop the differential geometry. It was already known, but he just took them from the mathematicians.
So let's look at this one. We have this operator, which was acting on this state, let's say, on this cat alpha. And let's also consider this thing. So when we act with H on the cat alpha, we obtain another cat. And since we have a cat, if we take another cat beta, we can form the bra of that cat. And we can just take the inner product of the bra and the cat. So this one, this is a cat, and this is a bra. We can talk about their inner product. Well, we can do one more thing. We can just play with it. We know the resolution of identity. This was alpha i, alpha i. This is our identity operator. I can write an identity operator here and another identity operator here. I will just put two identity operators. So this becomes beta sum over i, alpha i, alpha i. This is my identity. My Hermitian operator. Then I put another identity, sum over j, alpha j, alpha j. And then the ket alpha. Well, this sum over i, i is what we call the dummy index. We are just summing over it. So you can just give it an whichever name you want. You don't have to call it i, i. But I know that this summation over here is independent of this summation over here. There are two different summations. But not to confuse, I just give them different names. I call one i, the other one j. Now let me take that sum out, i, sum over i and j. I have beta times alpha i. Alpha i h alpha j, alpha j, alpha. That number can be written as this sum. I can reinterpret this sum in a different form. <coughs> I had this alpha, ket. I know that I can write this ket as a sum over the alpha i, or let's say alpha j, ket times alpha j alpha. This is my ket. Well, you see, this number over here also appears here. Well, that kind of makes, makes sense. Once you choose your ket's alpha j, all the properties of a vector are kind of encoded in, the, in its components, these numbers over there. Now, rather than showing this as a summation, I can also show the same alpha in this form. Now, this is the notation used in your book. They are not equal. It's just a way of showing the same thing. As a column matrix. Just let's look at the, uh, a real example. Okay, so we have this vector. How can we specify this vector? I can show it to you. Okay, this is my vector from here to there. Okay, that's a way of showing exactly the same vector. Well, it's not so useful because you cannot really manipulate it. Or what I can do is I can choose my x, y, and z axis. And in terms of this x, y, and z axis, I can just give you some numbers. 
this much in the x direction, this much in the y direction, this much in the z direction. So those three numbers will tell you what is my vector exactly. So just saying that, okay, this is my vector, is the same thing as giving you the x, y, z component. Or it's also the same thing as saying that, okay, this vector makes this angle with the theta. If you take the projection on the x, y plane, it makes this angle with the x axis, and its magnitude is this much. So those three numbers also give you the same information. They are not the, the three numbers is not your vector. Your vector is different than your three numbers. But those three numbers have exactly the same information as your vector. In that sense, those numbers, these numbers, are not my ket. But those numbers, once I choose my basis, carries exactly the same information as my ket. That's the idea. And those numbers, I, am, I will have many numbers, as many numbers as the dimension of my space. Rather, I can also show them as a column matrix. It's just a bunch of numbers. How can you show them? A bunch of numbers, you can just organize them in whichever way you like, whichever way seems easier, suitable, etc. For example, if you want to use uh, computers to do the computation for you, I mean, you cannot uh, tell a computer what a cat is, but you can store in a computer what the components are, what these numbers are. So though in that sense, using these numbers would be easier to write some code on the computer. But those numbers are not my cats. They are just a description of my cat. Yes. So that's basically what I did over here. I have this identity. I just put it in this matrix, in this inner product. Or in fact, here I'm also doing the same thing. I have alpha, I'm just putting the identity in front of it. So this is my identity. Now, of course, to be able to do that, I should know what matrices are. Which up to this point, I didn't mention any matrix. But if you know the properties of matrices and how you multiply matrices, it might be either some mathematician had invented it before the physicist or some physicist had just defined it using observing these things over here. What, whatever, whoever invented it, once you know the properties of your tools, when you see them, you know that you can use that tool in this problem. So this is one way of showing my kit beta. Well, I can alpha. I can do the same thing for beta. Beta would be, or let me just uh, do it the other way around. I have the bra beta. Now the bra beta, I can just insert that one over there, one times anything, just identity times anything, just gives me the same thing. But I know what that one is in terms of my basis states. Sum over i, alpha i, alpha i. So this will be equal to sum over i, beta times alpha i, alpha i. Again, these numbers over here, this time, specify, describe uniquely what my kit is, or what my bra is, sorry. So instead of using beta to show my uh, bra, I can just give you these numbers to describe you what my bra is. And this description is unique. Once you know the expansion coefficients of a vector in terms of your basis states, then that, those expansion coefficients uniquely specify your vector. Now, of course, if you compare, look at this one and this one, they are kind of slightly different in the sense that if you look at the kit and the column matrix represented the, representing the kit, the kit is on the right. Whereas if you look at the bra, the bra is on the left. Well, I can still 
we change their order. Just remember that beta alpha i is nothing but alpha i beta complex conjugate. This is how I define my inner product. So my ket, not the bra, I can show it as this column matrix. Now my, okay, this is, I can, this just means it's not equal to, I'm just showing my ket in this column matrix form. Then the bra, I will just define it as, I will show it as, let's say, well, let me move it here. This will be equal to beta alpha 1, beta alpha 2. But this is nothing what alpha 1 beta, alpha 2 beta. Well, I have to do two things. First of all, I have to change the order of the bra and the ket. Well, that is complex conjugation. And I have to convert a row matrix into a column matrix. Now that is the transpose. <coughs> so in terms of the column matrices, so the ket bra, sorry, is just the ket dagger, the Hermitian conjugate. The uh, the complex conjugate transpose. Well, let me give these some names. Let me call this column matrix A and this column matrix, this row matrix as B. Or not that one, sorry. This one as my B. So that, let's say alpha I beta is nothing but the I component of this row matrix. And beta times alpha i is just the i component complex conjugate. Now just try to keep track. B is a matrix. So when I'm working with B, I have to pay attention to their order, for example, at which place it appears. Bi is just one component of that matrix. Like I have this real vector, it's a vector but I can talk about its x component, which can be, let's say, two meters. It's just a number. The i is a number, a complex number in general, so that I, don't, I can be more relaxed about where I put it. Numbers, their order I can just change. Similarly for a. Now let me define one more thing. So we had this product over here. And finally, this thing. I will call this HIJ. So this H, I can show it as a matrix in this form. It will be alpha 1, H, alpha 1. Keep in mind, this is just a number. Alpha 1, H, alpha 2, etc. So the second one is just a column label. 
And the first one, the second row will be alpha 2, H, alpha 1, alpha 2, H, alpha 2. This is the row label, etc. Now this is alpha i h alpha j is a complex number. Well, that number will have a different value, of course, if the operator is different or if they are for each alpha i and alpha j, it will have a different value. But nevertheless, for a given operator h, if you choose your basis states alpha, alpha i, then they say alpha 1 h alpha 1 is just a complex number. Of course, for a different operator, it will have a different value. For a different basis, it will have a different value, even if it's the same operator. But once you make your choices, again, if you go back to the real space, this is a vector. Okay, this is a, we are given this vector, or we have chosen this vector. That was the first choice. Then we are free to choose our basis, x, y, and z. I make that choice also. So the coordinates, and the operators or the vectors, we don't really have a choice. We will just use whichever vector is suitable for us in that given problem, but we are always free to choose our axis. So we choose our basis. Once I choose my axis, the component of this vector in the x direction is just a number. It can be 1, 0 0.5, etc. That number will be different for a different vector, and that number will be different for a different basis. But nevertheless, whatever direction you choose as your x, for that given vector, the x component is just a number. No, my basis is this one. This is my basis. There's no, no, nothing called a column basis or a row basis. So each one of these <coughs> that I define using my basis is a number. You see how I define them? You pick alpha j. You act on alpha j with your operator h. So once you choose your operator, you should not, I mean, defining an operator would mean defining how it changes a given ket. That is how we define an operator. So we, we are given a ket. You just choose that ket alpha j as one of your basis kets. You act on it with your operator h. And then you obtain another ket. And you take the inner product of that new ket with some member of your basis ket, kets. You see, operators are not numbers. Operators are. Uh, a group, let's say, of their own. Now, operators, what they do is, you give them some kits, they give you another kit. Okay, so, now we had said that kits, we can always describe them by numbers. That's their components. You see here, or let me see here. Instead of this kit alpha, I can describe that ket alpha by a collection of numbers, these numbers. Now, what an operator does is it changes one ket into a different ket. Well, since each ket is des described by these numbers, basically what an operator does is it changes this set of numbers into a different set of numbers. How does it do that? Well, the, what operator does is it takes your initial set of numbers, describing your first ket, the alpha ket. It takes linear combinations of these numbers to give you another collection of numbers, which describes your second set. Now, operator is not a number. But then I can describe this operator as a collection of numbers. Just like I can describe a ket as a collection of numbers, these ones, I can describe my operator H using this collection of numbers. 
So that is why I am avoiding the, and the book is avoiding the use of equality sign. The operator is not equal to this collection of numbers, but I can use this collection of numbers to describe my operator. So you see, the problem is, how do you, I mean, we said that an operator takes one cat, transforms it in, into another cat. How do you describe this? Okay, that's the definition, but how do we describe this? One way is just giving this set of numbers. Another way that we will be using, for some operators, we will be able to write them as some differential operators acting on functions. That's just another way of showing the same thing. But the abstract concept of operator is neither a differential thing nor these matrices. So there is this abstract concept of the cats and operators. So the problem is how do we concretely uh, specify them? How do we make manipulations with them? So we have to somehow represent these operators as some, things, some other things that we can play with or the computers can play with. One choice is as matrices. Well, computers are great in doing matrix, com matrix products. So if you need to multiply operators, if you know their matrix representation, just let the computer do it. Another way would be just to, if you can represent it as a differential operator. Well, not all operators can be represented as differential operators. But we are basically seeing here that every operator can be described as a matrix. Okay, let me just finish this discussion and then you can go for a break. So you see, we had defined this matrix. Now, how do you multiply matrices? Let's say we, just for simplicity, let's take a simple two by two matrix, multiply it with some row matrix. How do you make this product? So basically what you do is you just take one row of your first matrix, one column of your second matrix, and just multiply the corresponding elements and sum them up. AE plus BF. And do the same thing for the other rows and other columns, if there are other columns. So this will be CE plus df. Well, let's look at this product. Let's look at this summation over j. Now, we are fixing i because we are first summing over j. We are fixing i. Well, i is the row. So you are, once you specify your i, you are just specifying which row you are taking the first row or the second row. Then you sum over the value, then this is the column. You choose the row. Well, this is the jth row of this matrix. So this, it has only one column. So that's the only column you have. You take the, multiply the, you took the ith row, you take the jth column of the ith row of the first matrix, multiply it with the jth row of the second matrix. This is nothing but matrix multiplication. So let me write it explicitly here. Alpha i, h, alpha j, alpha j beta is 
equal to, this time it's an equality. Because this is a number, at, and that number I called Hij. This is Hij. No, this is alpha. This is Aj summed over J, but this is nothing but matrix multiplication. Of course, this is the ith element of that matrix. Now, let me put an M over here. Just to make sure that H, this HM, this is the matrix representation of H. Well, you can think of it like this if you want. I mean, given your photograph, I can take your photograph and show it to one of my friends, let's say. So this is one of my students. He will know what you look like, but he will, I mean, what he sees will not be you. So what you are and what your photograph is are different things. Or if you, I mean, I, I don't need to print it out. I can just take your photograph with my uh, phone. In that case, what the telephone does by taking a photograph is just, it just stores some numbers in its memory. And then just creates an image using those uh, numbers. And I can show it to my friend. Basically, my friend will see some bunch of numbers interpreted as an image on the screen of my iPhone. Those collection of numbers carries uh, almost all the information about your appearance. But those collection of numbers is, not defi is definitely not you. So these matrices corresponding to operator is basically the same thing. That matrix that I use to show my operator H is not my operator, but it carries all the information that my operator has. Uh, that information basically means how that operator changes cats from one kit to the other cat. So this is what we sometimes call the representation. It's not the same thing, it's just a way of representing the information stored in that thing. Our operator H, we can represent it as a matrix. The cats, again, we can represent them as column matrices. The bras, we can represent them as row matrices. They're just representations. They carry the same information, more or less, but they are not the same thing. And finally, once you make this identification, this alpha, no, uh, beta, H alpha, we can just write it as beta star transpose H M A. Or B dagger H M A. Now, how do we do that? Well, let's look at this summation again. So we had this thing. This is equal to i, beta alpha i. Now the summation over j, we said that we can write it as a matrix product of the matrix representation of h multiplied with a i. i, this is alpha i beta star h m a i. This number over here is nothing but the i i element of this row matrix beta. Well, a is a row matrix. 
H M is a column matrix, or is a square matrix. So if you multiply a square matrix with a row matrix, you get a row matrix. So this is a row matrix. Sorry, column matrix. Now this is a row matrix. This is also a column matrix, sorry. Now B is a column matrix. If you take it star, it's a column matrix. But if you have a row matrix, you have to multiply it with a column matrix to get a number. So this is just a number. Or a one by one matrix, if you like. So first of all, if I want to write this as a matrix product, I should treat this as a row, not a column. So how do we multiply matrices? We took the row from the first matrix, the column from the second matrix, multiply the corresponding elements and sum. So if you want to treat this as a matrix multiplication, I have to treat the first number as the elements of a row, the second as the elements of a column. And the second is already the column matrix. The first one, if it's, a, it's also a column matrix, but I can easily convert it into a row matrix by just taking the transpose. So I, have to, I can write this as B conjugate, but also transpose, multiplied with H, multiplied with A. So this is B dagger, H, A. So basically, the long story short, whatever bra you have, whatever ket you have, you can always write it as a column matrix once you choose your basis. Whatever operator you have, you can always write it as a square matrix. Now the ket, we said that it was alpha, no, the, the bra, we said that it was the ket star, or a more proper notation would have been a dagger. This we can always write as a row matrix. And if you consider the product, products of this form, these you can always write it as the row matrix corresponding to your bra, the square matrix corresponding to your operator, and the column matrix corresponding to your cat. So in a sense, this multiplication in our bra space and the operator space, this abstract space, is just like matrix multiplication. And if you have two operators, H1 and H2, H1 will have its matrix, H2 will have its matrix. You can actually show that this is nothing but the matrix corresponding to H1 and the matrix corresponding to H2. Well, it depends. For example, you see, what you are interested in. Are you all interested in only the appearance? How it looks from one direction? That's kind of one, let's say, one space des describing our system. Then photograph is a perfect replica. But if you want to know the three-dimensional image in all directions, of course, just an ordinary photograph will not have exactly the same information. You also need, let's say, a hologram. Hologram might still carry exactly the same information. But if you want, let's say, uh, the interior beauty of the person, 
Well, of course, the photograph will not carry that information. So similarly, for physical systems, we will be dividing the properties of the physical systems into various parts. For example, we will be talking about uh, the spin property, so something that we, had already, we have been already talking, and we will be discussing in the next hour. Uh, but the spin itself doesn't give a full description of our system. We should also know it's, let's say, position dependence. So spin operators will not have all the information about my system. I have to complement it with things uh, related with its position. And sometimes spin and position is also not enough. I have to complement it with more things. Now that is basically what we call research. So what is uh, the best uh, faithful description of a given system? So, for example, we know that all the, prot uh, all the particles are made up of uh, quarks and electrons. But if you are only interested in, I don't know, the mass of an object, you don't have to start from a description containing the quarks and the electrons. Or if you only want to know the chemical properties, you don't even know what is in need to know what is inside the nucleus. You don't need all that information. You can just work with a limited information. And your operators will be acting on only on that limited information. But for your purposes, it will be enough. It will, be, it will allow you to determine all the chemical properties of a given system. Well, eventually we will be multiplying operators. So how do you show them in matrices? You cannot. You see, you see the dimension of your operators here. You see, this specifies the dimension of the matrix representing your operator. It is given by the uh, number of elements in your basis. It is fixed. Mm -hmm. So once you fix your, once you choose your space, the number of elements that you can put in your basis is fixed. And all the operators acting in that space, let's say your uh, basis has n elements, all the operators acting in your space can be represented by n by n matrices. Well, of course, then we will have some other uh, more complicated examples, like we will have a, a, a space describing the spin property of our system. That will be a two-dimensional space. Then we also have the position properties of our system. That's an infinite dimensional space. Well, the spin operators, we always show them as two-dimensional. We will always show them as two-dimensional because they will basically act on just a two-dimensional part of our kit. In a sense, yeah. I mean, we are getting a more complete description of your system. But of course, not all the information you need to study some of the properties of the system. But if you are only studying the strong Gerlach experiment, you just need to know the spin to, to tell whether it goes up or down. But if you want to know when it arrives, or what will be its energy distribution, you need to know much more things, and your description should take into account all those properties. Let's give a break, a 10-minute break, and then we can continue.